There we go. How are you? Well, I was hoping to catch the dog as she walked by. Yeah, she's here. But uh, you know, there she showed herself a little bit. She did. <laughs> Indeed, she did. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. It's so nice to see you and to see this absolutely beautiful book. Isn't that a nice package? It's uh... You know, it's gorgeous. And because I've learned that um, there can be some Easter eggs, I did take off the cover to see that there's <laughs> this very nice... Um, I'm assuming this is our hero, Quinn, in silver. Yeah. On one, end, one board, he's walking a step, and the other board, he's standing still. I, that fascinates me, all the detail they're putting into the books, because you both, we both know New York publishers have ceased to do anything like that. Uh, they do make very elegant books, and um, I was caught by surprise the first time I didn't take off the dust jacket, but now... <laughs> I have learned. So I want to say thank you for setting a book entirely in Arizona. What an absolutely delightful surprise. Uh, well, you know, mostly books take a lot of research time. Uh, so if I set it where I kind of know it or do know it well, then I can escape some of the necessary research. And that's, that's a partly selfish region I do it. Plus, I like the Arizona landscape. Well, I do too. In fact, I remember you asked me a while back to send you photos of the local flora, hardly any fauna, unless it were my dogs, and I did. But And, and so you have a sentence that I think is so fabulous. I'm going to read this sentence because I have read it several times and I truly love it. And it's on, um, it starts chapter eight. So it's a little bit in, but it's not a spoiler. So our hero, um, and companions are traveling in Arizona. They were good companions, even as they were silent, as they were for a while, as we followed a serpentine route through Scottsdale and then through Tempe, where the unfortunately named Hohokam people ruled so long ago that not even the whitest and most farsighted among those ancestors had foreseen the rainbow's end. That would be Indian casinos. And that, Dean, is a really fabulous sentence. Well, thank you. It's uh, the character Quinn has an interesting way of viewing the world, has an interesting sense of humor. And he's this, to me, interesting combination of novite and a sort of insight that's beyond his years uh, as he uh, makes his way through this sort of picaresque novel and road story. But you start, him, I think one of the things you really enjoy doing is writing children who are in, you know, interesting situations. So Quinn Quicksilver, the name of our hero here, um, is, a, is a foundling. That's very Dickensian. Yeah. He's, uh, the thing that started this novel was that image of a, uh, of a baby in a bassinet abandoned on a lonely desert highway. And uh, when something like that comes in your head, you either think you need counseling or it's a novel idea. And uh, then if it's a novel idea, where is this going? Uh, and I thought the story is the baby's story, but you can't have a point of view of an infant to tell a novel. So I had to wait till he was grown up at 19 years old. And, uh, and then it was, you know, as I've said before, I don't use an outline. So it's figuring out, well, what is this story about? And uh, it, it was, it was interesting to me that he's, uh, first thing I knew was here's somebody isn't wanted as an infant. He's left on a lonely highway. Then he goes to an orphanage, orphanage where no one will adopt him over the years. And then suddenly when he's 19, everybody in the world is after him and why. And that was the fun that I had trying to figure that out for a while. Did you, from the beginning, decide that the, the three men that find him, because he is abandoned on the roadside, so how does he get to the orphanage run by the sisters? Um, did you decide he was going to be a lineman as an occupation, the man that found him, or did that come back in? Because you have, you know, you have a character named Sparky, you have a lineman um, finding the baby. You know, did PG&E influence you? Since California <laughs> seems to be rife with, you know, electrical connections and so forth? Well, as I was trying to think, what are these three men, what, where are their jobs at, that they're coming at this lonely hour of the morning on this same lonely highway? And one of them could be a lineman. Uh, and as soon as I thought of that, I knew I'd have fun with it because of the song, uh, the, the Glenn Campbell song. Uh, uh, 
lineman for the county. And ultimately that turns into some of the funnier lines in the book uh, when he meets the gentleman who owns the, uh, the sort of local convenience store shopping center at this little town of Pepto. Uh, so I'm always sort of thinking ahead, what would be fun later on? And I knew as soon as it was alignment, I'd have some fun with that. Well, you did have fun with it. And don't I remember that if we really examine their last names when revealed, there's some sort of hint of the three wise men? <laughs> yeah, I tried to disguise that. A little bit. I, you know, I've never, I, I do books that are cross genre. And I often have a little element of science fiction in it or an element of uh, supernatural. I try to keep it grounded in the real world and not let it get too far out there. And that's why I think I've always sort of avoided an outright fantasy element. This one goes there. It uses the Nephilim. I changed the spelling of the word a little to line it up with nihilism. Uh, and uh, uh, it has various mythological pathways through it. And I wanted to emphasize that. So I thought it would be kind of fun if you say, OK, he is some kind of special human being. So it would be kind of amusing the three men who find them have historically uh, meaningful names. Absolutely. No, it was one of the many things I loved about it. And this is a very funny book. Um, it's, it's satirical. Um, and, you know, you're never mean. Um, I do think that, you know, no matter how, um, how you satirize things, there's always um, a kind of kindness to it. I, I really enjoyed reading it because right at the moment, the way the world is, I don't want to read anything that's really unkind. I don't want to write anything that is, yeah, I, I, I avoid the news days simply because uh, I'm not in the mood to handle it. So uh, it's uh, the, when, when you've got uh, basically a thriller or a suspense novel, and you're adding humor to it. The, the downside of that is when it gets really into the third act, the humor tends to fade away as the stakes get higher and higher. And that became a difficult thing for me because I, I liked Quinn's voice. So I had to find little ways to still sneak it in. But uh, the third act is pretty dark in that way. Well, true, but I like, you know, without, it, this isn't gonna spoil anything, but uh, there's another bit that I, I really like when Quinn is talking about at the end of the journey, we don't have to tell you how the journey ends, but he does say, I am not the easygoing Quinn Quicksilver, who I used to be when I wrote for Arizona Magazine, had a fear of parking garages and fantasized that my father might be a mob boss, my mother, a former supermodel, now disfigured and living with a sack over her head. I'm okay not being him because I wasn't in love with anyone then, and now I am. I didn't have a family then, and I have one now, even if it's unconventional. And I, I really love that, you know, because I mean, it's a, there's a quest here, it's a coming of age story, but I like the way that, you know, he accepts what, what has happened to him and decides that his future will be a good one. It's, uh, you know, some, an editor once said to me, there is a, there's an element in your fiction that keeps showing up over and over in most novels. And I kind of bristled because I, at the same time, publishers in those days always accused me of, of writing too many different things. And she said, well, I'm not saying the novels are alike, but I'm saying in quite a few of them, there's a, your lead character, somebody who has lost his family, not had a family, or, her, or she hasn't had a family. And in the course of the story, puts one together from strangers they meet. And I looked at that editor and said, my God, you're right. And I know why that is, because I never had a home life that was a settled one. And I yearned for it as a child and adolescent. So now when I'm writing, uh, it's, it's there. I make it happen for these people. Is it? And in a sense, it, it happened for me as I grew up and took control of my life. I made sure I was going to surround myself with people who became an extended family. So it becomes a theme I don't think I can escape. Well, you know, but it's also, it feels, I hate the word authentic, but in any case, it does feel because you're obviously, you know, touching on your own emotions and your own experience. But I, I've always liked the fact in all the books about that I read that you have written, which is not all of them, I have to say, because you are an incredibly prolific writer, but 
I do like the fact that um, that family coalesces in some fashion, you know, for whoever the person is. Uh, but one of the other things I really enjoyed in this book, Dean, uh, because you're a writer and you know the power of writing, is that um, that Quinn, you know, his job is writing for Arizona Magazine. So were you thinking Arizona Highway or is Arizona just, you know, the name that seems obvious for this kid to be working? I don't quite remember where that came from, but I thought since he, when we meet him, he thinks he wants to be a writer. There's a funny moment later on when he decides why that's actually not something he wants to be. It's probably not the happiest of lives. And uh, But if he was going to be a writer, I thought, oh, he's not writing novels yet. He's 19. Uh, so the sisters at the orphanage got him a job writing little pieces for a magazine. Then the natural was, uh, I would make it a yeah, so. magazine with an exclamation point. Uh, which later somebody says, we were going to subscribe to your magazine, but we were put off by the exclamation point. And uh, I knew that if he was doing that kind of writing, I could have fun with it. Well, I think, you know, the power of story, obviously, you know, is, is for you in your life, huge. Um, and so I think that, you know, emphasizing the power of a story in the book, but then you had a lot of fun with Sparky Ranking, who is um, one of the, the group that he ties in and he moonlights, Sparky is a guy, but he moonlights as best-selling novelist, Daphne Larkrise. So, but, but you, did you, you didn't, I don't think that you ever actually have any of the, you know, any quotes from the romance that in theory, Sparky Daphne is writing. No, I, I thought about doing that. And then I thought, I also say in this that uh, Sparky has quite a background. He's the grandfather of the female lead. And, uh, and they're all sort of on the run in this. And, uh, and we're, we're told that he was something, something very strange once. Or, and then he was something uh, beyond that. And then he was something we don't talk about. Uh, and you get the sense this guy's had a really checkered past in terms of uh, he could have been maybe not checkered so much as just maybe a Navy SEAL, maybe this, maybe that. Uh, and then when I'm layering on top of that, that he uh, moonlights as a romance novelist and has been very successful at it, I thought better not to quote this than to try to marry these two people and pull this off. Uh, just let everybody imagine what a sparky brain came. Uh, dark Daphne, dark light, rise, lark rise novel might be like. Well, I think that was probably a wise decision. But one of the advantages of Sparky being a best selling novelist is that there's money involved, you know. I mean, because sometimes, I mean, it can really hamper you on a, on a quest or a journey if you have absolutely no resources. So, you know, you solve that at a blow by making him so successful. And of course, you yourself know how the income of writers, you know, how it comes and goes, fluctuates, whatever it might be. So I love that, that part of it. Um, why do, you know, this book is so funny that, and I've read many of your books that there always is humor, but this one, I think, particularly taps into that. Were you just in a mood for, for humor when you decided to write it? Well, uh, there's a couple of things influenced that. I think it was, I wrote The Other Emily, uh, which is was very dark. There was very little place for humor in it. Uh, and when I come through a dark story like that, I just kind of don't want to do a second one quite that way. I want to keep my psychology straight. <laughs> and uh, as a consequence, I decided, ah, let's do something amusing. I originally thought I'd do something more in the vein of what is probably the funniest book I ever wrote, Life Expectancy. But, uh, but I ended up with, uh, with this one, with this little fantasy element. And I was having fun. I think it probably comes across that I was having fun. Well, you also have, you know, um, it's hard to make humor out of government control, but we do have <laughs> Quinn um, running into um, a kind of a surveillance crew and so a big question in the book is, you know, why is anybody surveilling this kid? And, you know, where is that going? Which we won't go into because it'd be spoilers, but I really like that. And you decided to name them after angels, oh, which of course is wonderfully contradictory. Yes, and, uh, and again, not 
I, I won't spoil it either, but one of the moments that, uh, you know, you're putting together the idea in your head, and this one came together within an hour, I guess, uh, the, the little abandoned baby, and um, it starts the story when he's 19, and he hadn't been wanted by anybody, then he's wanted by everybody. Then the question is, why does everybody want him? And I think it took about 15 minutes, I was sitting here thinking about it, and when I thought of why everybody wanted him, I laughed out loud. That was the moment I knew, okay, I have to write this uh, because that's that's just too much fun. And, uh, and then when you're doing it, anyway, you can, uh, it's, yeah, the term Easter eggs. Uh, the first time I ever heard that, uh, I was a little slow because I don't go online particularly, but somebody had used it, not quite a number of books ago, and said it was one thing they loved so much about it. And uh, after I heard that, and I realized what they're talking about, I said, Actually, we used to call that subtext. <laughs> That's part of what subtext is. But I like the term Easter eggs. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Dean. I don't know what happened. Are you still there? Yeah. On our screen, it said your bandwidth was low. Well, there's something strange going on, and I need my husband to fix this. I apologize. I didn't have no any problem. idea I was going to disappear. Um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe we shouldn't hang around too long, and we'll try to fix it. I did want to ask you because you know I've known you now for for many years, and you've you've gone to a different publisher from when I first met you, and you seem to be incredibly energized. I mean, you know, your life really appears to be writing and you're having so much fun with it. Am I wrong or, or am I right that you are just truly enjoying being so productive? Uh, absolutely. I will say, I don't know if I've talked with you about this before, but when I decided I had to make a change from Random Miles, my agents uh, put the list together of everybody to go to. And then at the sort of last minute, they added on uh, Amazon publishing, Sperling and Cooper. And I said, I don't think that it's fine doing novelettes with Amazon original stories, but I don't know about novels. And I decided, well, these are my agents and I should listen to them. And, uh, and it turned out that when I got all the, everybody's proposals for marketing, that was the decision. Amazon's was 30 or 40 pages. The biggest other one was two pages. And some people didn't even give marketing plans. It, it didn't come down to money, particularly. It came down to it looked like a much greater level of enthusiasm and savvy. And that's what it's been. And I like the people I'm working with so much. And they're doing such a beautiful job on production of the books. And they're so creative that it makes it all a lot of fun that I, I began to realize it hadn't been for a longer than I wanted to admit it. So yeah, it's greatly energizing to work with a crew who is uh, very excited about all we're doing together. Well, you are doing an amazing amount. And one of the other great things is that um, they give you the freedom to do that. I mean, you know, so often writers are put into boxes where they're successful, but um, that doesn't appear to be an issue for you. I noticed that we have a new background behind you. So, you know, I remember your beautiful library in the house you lived in mm. many years ago. How, how easy has it been for you to move your library from residence to residence when you have such an impressive array of books? It was kind of hell. Uh, you know, this, this is my assistant's office, Linda's, and uh, we keep some books in here. This house is, we had bought a house to remodel and we, it's not gonna be ready for another year and a half. And when somebody came by and bought the house we were in, even though it wasn't on the market with an offer we couldn't refuse. And I said, well, we need an interim house. So we had to do a quick remodel here. And I thought, what are we gonna do with my library? I have to have it. And uh, there was not room in this house and we had to be in it in six months. Uh, and there was an indoor pool, which I have no use for. And we took the indoor pool out and it was a very large room and we built it in downstairs. And uh, I was able to move most of my library. There's still stuff in storage, but uh, we were able to get an interim library that's very pretty. It's made out of the same wood that the one was in my other house by the same craftsman. So I felt like I was almost in the old home in terms of the library. I just have to go downstairs instead of down the hall to get to it. Well, that's wonderful. I think it's very hard to be divorced from something as personal and as meaningful to you 
as your own library. I think the thing that I remember really distinctly about the house that you have sold was the bar. And I've always meant to ask you because, you know, there are ice bars that are, I mean, I've traveled up in the frozen north and actually been to an ice bar, but you had a, you had a bar that resembled an ice bar, but clearly it wasn't because we were in Southern California. Uh, what, what was the inspiration for the bar? We had hired a, a, a guy who was an art glass specialist. He's actually uh, Gordon Uther. He's relatively world famous now. He wasn't quite so yet at that time. And he did some of the front doors in the house, uh, art glass windows, other place. And at one point he said, I have this piece of stuff. I don't, we don't know what to do with it. It's cast glass. It's six inches thick. And he had a chunk of it and it's full of these little bubbles. And, uh, and you control how many bubbles you want in it, but we don't know what to do with it. And my wife, who is very creative her own said, that would make a fabulous bar top. Uh, and then it evolved that we got fiber optic lighting shooting through this bar top that was, I think, 10 or 12 of these slabs. Each of the slabs weighed 600 pounds. So this bar became a major construction thing. And, uh, but it turned out it was quite beautiful and, uh, and different. So, and everybody, we thought we were going to freeze it on the white light so that it looked like ice, just as you said. But everybody liked to watch it change color, so we never ended up freezing it. I mean, it was, it's impossible to forget it. It was so outstanding. <laughs> and in tribute to you, I brought this up. There is a outdoor lighting company that is made that solar power has made it possible to do some really amazing things. And um, these are lights that each of them has a little solar panel in the top and you stab yeah. it in the ground, however it goes. Uh -huh. And then you can set it so that it actually behaves like your bar. It, the lights will change. And I can look out the window now at the garden and I can see these, you know, these colors. <laughs> but you inspired that because I was so <laughs> entranced with your bar. I also remember that there was no like flap. And so in order to get behind the bar, if you, which I didn't do because I wasn't the bartender, you actually had to do kind of a dive underneath it. Um, it was like the ice had been sculpted out. Do I remember that right? Yeah, we, we didn't want to break the curve of the bar. It was a big... That curve. Uh, and if we'd have left a slab out in the middle to get in, it would have not look so quite so sweet. And uh, so we said, well, we're still young enough. We can get down and go under the bar. Then one of the things, this was a house built to ride out an 8.2 earthquake with no damage. It's called critical building standard. That meant the support walls were two foot thick board in place concrete with rebar in them. And the back wall of that bar happened to be one of the support walls. And after we decided it was going to have this bar, we suddenly thought, uh-oh, if we have a party and a caterer brings in cases of beer and wine, they're going to be slamming them down on this glass. So we had to cut out that wall in the back bar so that they had a way to put it in. And when, I, when my builder heard we needed to cut out a two by four section of that incredibly well built wall. He was bereft, but it, they managed to get it done and it saved us smashing things down on the bar. You know, it's interesting. They said, we were worried. Is that the bar going to crack someday? And they said, no, no, no. Once it's anchored in place, it'll never crack. And if it chips, just use an annealing torch and smooth it out. And it never had 20 years we lived there and it never had an issue. Isn't that wonderful? I've, I've always enjoyed the idea because, I mean, you obviously are interested in building and construction um, as well as, you know, you, you construct your novels so carefully. Has that, is that been sort of how, which was first? Did you learn to structure narrative and then applied it to building or did you learn about building and then apply it to narrative? I think the building came after uh, I started to being much more concerned about the, the novels and the use of the language and the structure. And then for somehow that just seeped into everything else. Uh, we became interested in interior design, journey and I together, then architecture. And by the time we had uh, rebuilt a couple of houses uh, and then set about building them from the ground up, we were more and more versed in it. And uh, one thing I love about the fact that we're uh, we're doing another house that is a year and a half from now. Is we're working with the same uh, uh, designer uh, 
who does architectural design. And he's not exactly an architect. He does the interior architecture, but he's extremely talented. And because we've been through a project before, we talked this shorthand and it gets very exciting. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's sort of very much the same feeling you get constructing a novel when you're constructing a physical thing to the degree that you can make it as perfect as you can possibly think to make it. And, uh, and there's an equal satisfaction to them, I think. I can easily understand that. And yet um, I find it so interesting that you love dogs so much and dogs, as, as you know, I now have two puppies that yes. are whatever. Dogs are unpredictable. You, th you think you know what you're doing with dogs and every once in a while, they can introduce <laughs> chaos into your life. <laughs> So maybe dogs are the way that you um, you have an outlet for for chaos. Well, I have to tell you, when Elsa first came to live with us, she was 21 months old. She'd been through the assistance dog training, but she flunked out because she wanted to cuddle and not work. And that seemed perfect to us. But she was high energy. And we were living in that other house. And there were antiques everywhere and antique breakable antiques as well. And she would get in a mood where you stood back. She would run through that house, leaping over sofas, chairs, fast as a bullet, right past a valuable antique. And we all just gritted our teeth. And over the years she was doing that there, she never broke anything. It was like she had this bat guidance, <laughs> but she had the radar and she was never going to cross the path of anything of value. So she's calming down now. I sort of hate to see that. But when she gets into one of those, I must run uh, things, then stand back and it's so glorious to watch the excitement she gets when she's in one of those moves. It truly is. One of the puppies, we called him Scooter because he, and the thing I love the most is that we have smooth, you know, tile surfaces and so forth, and he can't corner very well. He can <laughs> really get moving, but then his whole back end kind of breaks loose, you know, and he does sideways. There's a wonderful picture of Dean on the back with, as you can see, this beautiful dog. And yeah, so, so yeah. you know, it's something we share. Well, I hope if the pandemic ever, ever ends, or we feel <laughs> safe enough to travel, that one day, Either you will come to Scottsdale and we'll get to visit in person, or I will come to California and we'll do it that way. I would love that. I just don't want to have to do it in a hazmat suit. <laughs> no, I definitely agree. Dean, thank you for your time this afternoon. It's really been a great pleasure, as always, to talk to you. Um, I should add that Quicksilver, uh, we still have a few autographed copies. Probably we could obtain more. It's our January crime book of the month because I thought that mystery readers could use a stretch. And, you know, um, I, I, I really do. I think it's all too easy for us to fall into a rut and want to read the same books over and over again. And Quicksilver, I found to be just delightful, but also out of the ordinary way. So okay. I recommend it for that reason. And um, let me wish you a happy new year. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. It's always fun and happy new year. Thank you. Bye. Bye.